actually remember the naked vacuuming, but it sounds plausible. Um, so uh, I, I want to say a little word about horror before I start and, uh, and segue into something about uh, Dave and about some of my other work. Um, so as you heard, I live in London. I'm uh, married to a Londoner. And one night, uh, she was telling me a story about something she'd done as a child, uh, like as a wild teenager. And I said, oh my gosh, what a horror you must have been. She said, I beg your pardon, what did you say? And I said, what a horror you must have been. And she said, what, what did, and I said, well, you're a horror now. I mean, you must have been a total horror then when you were a teenager. Said, what a horror you were. She went, why are you saying this to me? And I said, you know, horror, horror, horror. And she said, oh, horror. And I said, no, that's the dance my people do at bar mitzvahs. Um, so it's lovely to be here in Kensington Market. I wrote a novel, some of you may know, I think there's a copy or two left over there, called Someone Comes to Town, Someone Leaves Town, set on this street. And it includes something I shamelessly stole from Dave Nichol, uh, which I've thanked him for before, but I'll thank him for again, the thumb, uh, the little thumb person, which was a complete lift from Dave's very good story, The Unshackling of Thumbs. So tonight I'm going to read to you from uh, a novel that's not out. Rather than read to you from something that you can go and, and buy, I will uh, give you something that you couldn't get anywhere else. Uh, a novel that won't be out until May 2012. It was actually finished quite some time ago, but I couldn't tour the spring with it because, uh, as you can see, I'm, um, I'm prosthetic right now. I, I, it turns out that I was born with some extra bone in my hip, which they have uh, dutifully opened up and removed with something resembling a Dremel tool. There are photos on Flickr, if you look. Uh, and as a result, I couldn't tour with it. So it won't be out until next May. Uh, the book is called Pirate Cinema. It will be also a tour teens book and a HarperCollins UK book. I will certainly be here on the tour. Uh, and uh, now I will read you the prologue. And it has these Dickensian chapter titles where, uh, with, with sort of brief summary and bullet form. So that's what I'm going to start with here. Prologue. A star finds true love, a knock on the door, a family ruined, on the road, alone. I will never forget the day my family got cut off from the internet. I was hiding in my room as I usually did after school let out, holed up with a laptop I bought third hand and nursed to health with parts from here and there and a lot of cursing and sweat. But that day, my little lappy was humming along, and I was humming along with it, because I was about to take Scott Colford's virginity. You know Scott Colford, of course. They'd been watching him on telly and at the cinema since my mum was a girl, and he'd been dead for a year at that point. But dead or not, I was still going to take poor little Scotty's virginity, and I was going to use Mona Lisa Fiora Oglethorpe to do it. You probably don't know that Scott and Mona Lisa did a love scene together, did you? It was over 50 years ago when they were both teen heartthrobs and they were co-stars in a genuinely terrible straight-to-web movie called No Hope about a pair of clean-cut youngsters who fall in love despite their class differences. It was a real weeper and the supporting appearances in roles as mum, dad, best mate, pastor, teacher, etc. were so forgettable that they could probably be used as treatment for erasing traumatic memories. But Scott and Mona Lisa, they had chemistry, and truth be told, Mona Lisa had geography too, hills and valleys and such. They smoldered at each other in the way that only teenagers can, juicy with hormones and gagging to get their newly hairy bits into play. <laughs> Adults like to pretend that sex is something that it begins at 18, but Romeo and Juliet were like 13. Here's something else about Scott and Mona Lisa. They both used body doubles for other roles around then. Uh, Scott didn't want to get his knob out for a 3D production of Equus, while Mona Lisa was paranoid about the spots on her back and demanded a double for her role in Bikini Trouble in Little Blackpool. <laughs> These body doubles, uh, Dan Cohen and Alana DeNova, were in another movie, even dumber than Bikini Trouble, called Summer Heat, and in Summer Heat they got their hairy bits into serious play. I'd known about the No Hope, Equus, Bikini Trouble, Summer Heat situation for like a year, and had always thought it'd be fun to edit together a little creative virginity losing scene between Scott and Mona Lisa since they were both clearly yearning for it back then, and who knows, maybe they slipped away from their chaperones for a little hide the chipolata in an empty trailer. 
But what got me into motion was the accidental discovery that both Scott and Mona Lisa had done another job together 10 years earlier when they were six, an advert for a birthday party service in which they chased each other around a suburban middle class yard with squirt guns, faces covered in cake and ice cream. I found this lovely, lovely bit of video on a torrent tracker out of somewhere in Eastern Europe. Google Translate said that it was written in Ukrainian, but it also couldn't get half the words, so who can say? It was this bit of commercial toss that moved me to cut the scene. You see, now I had the missing ingredient, the thing that took my mashup from something trite and obvious to something genuinely moving. A flashback to happier, carefree times, before all the hairy bits got hairy, before the smoldering began in earnest, etc. and so forth. The fact that the commercial footage was way, way down res from the other stuff actually made it better, because it would look like it came from an earlier era, a kind of home movie shaky cam feel that I bumped up using a video effect app that I found on yet another dodgy Eastern European site. Love them Eastern Europeans. <laughs> so there I was in my broom closet of a bedroom, headphones screwed in tight against the barking dogs of the uh, barking of the dogs in the ne next door in the Albertsons flat, wrists aching from some truly epic mousing, homework alerts piling up around the edge of my screen when the knock came at the door. It was definitely a capital K knock. The kind of knock they foley in for police flicks with a lot of ominous reverb that cuts off sharply. Wang, wang, wang. The thunder of authority on two legs. It even penetrated my headphones, shook all the way down to my balls with the premonition of something awful to come. I slipped the headphones around my neck hit the panic button key combo that put my lappy into paranoid lockdown, unmounting the encrypted disks and rebooting into a sanitized OS that had a bunch of plausible homework assignments and some innocent messages to my mates, all randomly generated. <laughs> then I crept out into the hallway and peeked around the corner as my mum answered the door. Can I help you? Mrs. McCauley? Yes. I'm Lawrence Foxton, a community support officer here on the estate. I don't think we've met before, have we? Community support officer, a fake copper, a volunteer policeman who gets to lord his tiny, ridiculous crumb of power over his neighbors, giving orders, enforcing curfews, dragging you off to the real cops for punishment if you refused to obey him. I knew Larry Foxton because I'd escaped his clutches any number of times, scarpering from the deserted playground with my pals before he could catch up, puffing along under his anti-stab vest and laden belt filled with taser, pepper spray, and plastic handcuff straps. I don't think so, Mr. Foxton. Mum had the hard tone in her voice she used when she thought me or Cora were playing her, a no-nonsense voice that demanded that you get to the point. Well, I'm sorry to have met you under these circumstances. I'm afraid that I'm here to notify you that your internet is being terminated effective. He made a show of looking at the faceplate on his police issue ruggedized mobile. Now, your address has been used to breach copyright through several acts of illegal downloading. You have been notified of these acts on two separate occasions. The penalty for a third offense is a one year suspension of network access you have the right to an appeal. If you choose to appeal, you must present yourself in person at the Bradford Magistrates Court in the next 48 hours. He hefted a little thermal printer clipped to his belt, tore off a strip of paper, and handed it to her. Bring this. His tone grew even more official and phony. Do you understand and consent to this? He turned his chest to face mom, ostentatiously putting her right in the path of the CCTV in his hat brim and over his breast pocket. Mum sagged in the door frame and reached her hand out to steady herself. Her knees buckled the way they did so often, ever since she'd started getting her pains and had had to quit her job. You're joking, she said. You can't be serious. Thank you, he said. Have a nice day. He turned on his heel and walked away, little clicking steps like a toy dog, receding into the distance as Mom stood in the doorway, holding the curl of thermal paper, legs shaking, and that was how we lost our internet. Anthony, she called. Anthony, she called again. Dad, hold up in the bedroom, didn't say anything. Anthony, hold on, will you? The bloody phone's not working, and I'm going to get docked. She wobbled down the hall and flung open the bedroom door. Anthony, they've cut off the internet. I ducked back into my room and cowered contemplating the magnitude of the vat of shit I had just fallen into, my stupid, stupid obsession with a dead film star 
had just destroyed my family. I could hear them shouting through the thin wall. Not words, just tones. Mum nearly in tears. Dad going from incomprehension to disbelief to murderous rage. Trent! It was like the scene in Man in the Cellar, the bowel-loosingly frightening Scott slasher movie. Scott's in the closet, and the murderer has just done in Scott's brother and escaped from the garage where they trapped him and is howling in fury as he thunders down the hallway, and Scott is in the closet, rasping breath and eyes so wide they're nearly all whites, and the moment stretches out like hot gum on a pavement. Trent! The door to my room banged open so hard it sent a pile of books tumbling off my shelf. One of them bounced off my cheekbone, sending me reeling back, head cracking against the tiny, grimy window. I wrapped my head in my hands and pushed myself back into the corner. Dad's big hands grabbed me. He'd been a scrapper when he was my age, a legendary fighter well known to the Bradford coppers. In the years since he'd taken accent training and gotten his job working the phone, he'd gotten a little fat and lost half a step, but in my mind's eye, I still only came up to his knee. He pulled my hands away from my face and pinned them at my sides and looked into my eyes. I thought he was angry, and he was, a little, but when I looked into those eyes, I saw that what I had mistaken for anger was really terror. He was even more scared than I was, scared that without the net, his job was gone, scared that without the net, Mum couldn't sign on every week to get her benefits, without the net, my sister Cora wouldn't be able to do her homework. Trent, he said, his chest heaving. Trent, what have you done? There were tears in his eyes. I tried to find the words. We all do it, I wanted to say. You do it, I wanted to say. I had to do it, I wanted to say. But what came out when I opened my mouth was nothing. Dad's hands tightened on my arms, and for a moment, I was sure that he was going to beat the hell out of me, really beat me, like you saw some of the other dads do on the estate. But then he let go of me and turned on his heel and stormed out of the flat. Mum stood in the door to my room, sagging hard against the door frame, eyes rimmed with red, mouth pulled down in sorrow and pain. I opened my mouth again, but again, no words came. I was 16. I didn't have the words to explain why I downloaded and kept downloading, why making the movie that was in my head was such an all-consuming obsession. I'd read stories of the great directors, Hitchcock, Lucas, Smith, and how they'd work their guts out, ruin their health, ruin their family lives, just to get the movie out of their head and onto the screen. In my mind, I was one of them, someone who just had to get this bloody movie out of my skull, like I was filled with holy fire and it would burn me up if I didn't send it somewhere. That had all seemed very noble and exciting and heroic, right up to the point that the fake copper came to the flat and took away my family's internet and ruined our lives. After that, it seemed like a stupid, childish, selfish whim. I didn't go home that night. I sulked around the estate, half hoping that my parents would come and find me, half hoping they wouldn't. I couldn't stand the thought of facing them again. First I, went, uh, first, I went and sat under the slide in the playground, where it was all stubs from spliffs and dried out, crumbly dog turds. Then it got cold, and so I went to the community center and paid my pound to get in, and hid out in the back of the room, watching kids play snooker and table tennis and uns with unseeing eyes. When they shut that down for the night, I tried to get into a couple of pubs, the kind of all-night places where they weren't so picky about checking ID. But they weren't keen on having obviously underage kids taking up valuable space and not ordering things. And so I found myself wandering the streets of Bradford, the ring road where the drunken boys and girls howled at each other in a grim par parody of merriment, swilling alco pops and getting into pointless, sloppy fights. I'd spent my whole life in Bradford, and, and in broad daylight, I felt like the whole city was my manor. No corner of it I didn't know, but in the yellow streetlight and sickly moon glow, I felt an utter stranger, a scared and very small and very defenseless stranger. In the end, I curled up on a bench in Peel Park, hidden under a rattly newspaper, and slept for what felt like 10 seconds before a CPSO woke me with a rough shake and a bright light in my eyes and sent me back to wander the streets. It was coming on dawn then, and I had a deep chill in my bones, and a drip of snot that replaced itself on the tip of my nose every time I wiped it away on my sleeve. 
I felt like a proper ruin and misery guts when I finally dragged my arse back home, stuck my key in the lock, and waited for the estate's ancient and cantankerous network to let me into our house. I tiptoed through the sitting room, headed for my room with my soft and wondrous bed. I was nearly to the door when someone hissed at me from the sofa, making me jump so high I nearly fell over. I whirled and found that my sister, found my sister sitting there. Cora was two years younger than me, and unlike me, she was brilliant at school. She brought home test papers. She brought home test papers covered in check marks and smiley faces, and her teachers often called on her to on her work, uh, on her to work with thick students to help them bring their grades up. I had shown her how to use my edit suite when she was only ten, and she was nearly as good an editor as I was. Her homework videos were the stuff of legend. At 13, Cora had been a slightly podgy and awkward girl who dressed like a little kid in shirts that advertised her favorite little bands. But now she was 14, and overnight she turned into some kind of actual teenaged girl with round soft bits where you'd expect them and new clothes that she and her mates made in the youth center's sewing machines from the stuff they had in their closets. She always had some boy or another mooching around after her, spotty specimens who practically dripped hormones on her. It roused some kind of odd brotherly sentiment in me that I hadn't realized was there, by which I mean I wanted to pound them and tell them that I'd break their legs if they didn't leave my baby sister alone. In private, Cora usually treated me with a kind of big bro reverence that harkened back to our lives as little kitties when I was the older sib who could do no wrong. In public, of course, I wasn't nearly cool enough to acknowledge, but that was okay. I could understand that. That morning, there was no reverence in her expression. Rather, she was seething with loathing. Arsehole, she said, spitting the word out under her breath. Cora, I said, holding my hands up, my arms feeling like they were hung with lead weights. Listen, forget it, she said in that same savage, hissing whisper. I don't care. You could have at least been smart, used a proxy, cracked someone else's wireless. She was right. The neighbors had changed their Wi-Fi password, and my favorite proxies had all been blocked by the great firewall, and I'd been too lazy to disguise my tracks. Now what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do my homework? I've got GCSEs soon. What am I supposed to do? Study at the library? Cora re revised every moment she had, odd hours in the morning before the house was awake, late at night after she'd come back from babysitting. Our nearest library closed at 5.30, and was only open four days a week thanks to the latest round of cuts. I know, I said, I know, I'll just, I waved my hands. I'd gotten to that, that far a few hundred times that night. I'll just, just what? Just apologize to Universal Pictures and Warner Brothers? Call the main switchboard and ask to speak to the head copyright enforcer and grovel for my family's internet connection? Some corporate mucker in California didn't give a rat's ass about my family or its internet access. You won't do shit, she said. She stood up and marched to her room. Before she closed her door, she turned and skewered me on her glare. Ever. I left home two weeks later. I wa it wasn't the disappointed looks from my dad, the increasing desperation of the whispered conversations he had with mum whenever finances came up, or the hateful filthies for my adoring little sister. No, it was the movie. Specifically, it was the fact that I still wanted to make my movie. There's only so much moping in your room you can do, and eventually I found myself firing up my lappy and turning back to my intricate editing project that had been so rudely interrupted, and before long I was absolutely engrossed in deflowering Scott Colford. And moments after that, I realized that I needed some more footage to finish the project, a scene from later in Bikini Trouble, when Mona Lisa was eating an ice cream cone with a sultry, smoldery look that would have been perfect for the post-Nookie moment. Reflexively, I lit up my downloader and made ready to go a-hunting for Mona Lisa's ice cream scene. Of course, it didn't work. The network wasn't there anymore. As the error message popped up on my screen, all my misery and guilt pressed back in on me. It was like some gigantic weight pressing on my chest and shoulders and face, smothering me, making me feel like the lowest, most awful person on the planet. It literally felt like I was strangling on my own awful emotions, and I sat there wishing I could die. I scrunched my eyes up as tight as I could and whispered the words over and over again, want to die, want to die. If wishing could make you pop your clogs, I would have dropped dead right there in my bedroom, and they'd have found me slumped over my keyboard, eyes closed, awful, whirling brain, finally silent. 
then they'd have forgiven me and they could go back to the council and ask to have the net reconnected and dad could get his job back and mom could get her benefits again and poor Cora would be able to graduate with top marks and go to Oxford or Cambridge where all the clever clogs and brain boxes went to meet up with all the other future leaders of Britain. I'd been low before, but never low like that, never wishing with every cell in my body to die. I found that I'd been holding my breath and I gasped in and finally realized that even if I didn't die, I couldn't go on living like that. I knew what I had to do. I had almost 100 quid saved up in a hollow book I'd made from a copy of Dracula that the local library had thrown away. I sliced out a rectangle from the center of each page by hand with our sharpest kitchen knife, then glued the edges together and left it under one of the legs of my bed for two days so that you couldn't tell from either side that there was anything tricky about it. I took it out and pulled my school bag from under the bed and carefully folded three pairs of clean pants, a spare pair of jeans, a warm hoodie, my toothbrush and the stuff that I put on my spots, a spool of dental floss and the little sewing kit that Cora had given me one birthday along with a good natured note about learning to sew my own bloody shirt buttons. It was amazing how easy it was to pack this all. Somewhere in the back of my mind I'd always known, I think, that I'd have to pack a small bag and just go. Some part of my subconscious was honest enough with itself to know that I had no place among polite society. Or maybe I was just another teenage dramatist caught up in my own tragedy. Either way, it was clear that my guilty conscience was happy to shut its gob and quit whining so long as I was in motion and headed for my destiny. No one noticed me go. Dinner had come and gone, and as usual, I'd stayed away from the family through it, sneaking out after all the dishes had been cleared away to poach something from the cupboard. Mom was gamely still cooking dinners, though increasingly they consisted of whatever was on deepest discount at Tesco's or something from the local church soup kitchen. She brought home an entire case of lethally salted ramen noodles and bright Cambodian packaging and kept trying to dress them up with slices of boiled eggs or bits of cheapest mints formed into half-hearted fatty meatballs. If they missed me at dinner, they never let on. I'd boil a cup of water and make plain noodles in my room and wash the cup and put it on the draining board while they were watching telly in the sitting room. Cora rarely made it to dinner too, but she wasn't hiding in her room. She was over at some mate's place, mooching free internet through a dodgy network bridge. None of the family's devices had network cards registered to work on the estate network, so the only way to get online was to install illegal software on a friend's machine and cable it to ours and pray that the net gods didn't figure out what you were about. And so no one heard me as I stole out the door and headed for the bus station. I stopped at a newsagent's by the station and bought a new pay-as-you-go SIM for cash, chucking the old one in three different bins after slicing it up with a tough little scissors from the sewing kit. Then I bought a coach ticket to London Victoria Terminal. I knew Victoria a bit from a school trip once, a family visit the summer before. I remembered it as bustling and humming and huge and exciting, and it was that image that I had in my head as I settled into my seat next to an old woman with a sniffle and a prim copy of the Bible that she read with a finger that traced the lines as she moved her lips and whispered the words. The coach had a slow wireless link and there were mains outlets under the seats. I plugged my lappy in and got on the wireless using a prepaid visa card I bought from the same newsagent shop, having given my favorite nom de guerre, Cecil B. DeVille. It's a tribute to Cecil B. DeMille, a great and awful director, the first superstar director, a man whose name was once synonymous with film itself. The trip to London flew by as I lost myself into flowering poor old Scott, grabbing my missing footage through a proxy in Tehran that wasn't too particular about copyright, though it was a lot pickier about porn sites or Iranian dissident information feeds. By the time the coach pulled into Victoria, my scene was perfect. I mean, perfect with blinking lights and a joyful tune, P-E-R-F-E-C-T, all two minutes, 25 seconds worth. I didn't have time to upload it to any of the YouTubes before the coach stopped, but that was okay. It would keep. I had a warm glow throughout my body like I'd just drunk some thick hot chocolate on a day when the air was so cold the bogeys froze in your nose. I floated off the coach and into Victoria Station and came crashing back down to earth. The last time I'd been in the station had been filled with morning commuters rushing to and fro, kids in school blazers and caps shouting and running, a few stern bobbies looking on, looking on with their ridiculous enormous helmets that always make me think of a huge looming cock, one that bristled with little lenses that stared around in all directions at once. 
But as we pulled in, a little after 9 p.m. on a Wednesday, rain shitting down around us and fat, dirty drops, Victoria Station was a very different place. It was nearly empty, and the people there that were there seemed a lot grimmer. They had downcast expressions, the ones that weren't openly hostile, like the beardy weirdy in an old raincoat who shot me a look of pure hatred and mouthed something angry at me. The coppers didn't look friendly and ridiculous. They were flinty-eyed and suspicious, and as I passed two of them, they followed me with their gaze and the tilt of their bodies. And I stood there in that high ceiling concourse, surrounded by the nutters and the farts of the night people and the night trains, and realized that I hadn't the slightest bloody idea what to do next what to do next. I wandered at the station, I wandered around the station a bit, bought myself a hot chocolate. It didn't make the warm feeling come back. Stared aimlessly at my phone. What I should have done, I knew, was buy a ticket back to home and get back on a coach and forget this whole business. But that's not what I did. Instead, I set off for London. Real London, roaring nighttime London, as I'd seen it on a thousand films and TV shows and internet vids. The London where glittering people and glittering lights passed one another as black cabs snuffled through the streets, chased by handsome boys and beautiful girls on bikes or scooters. That London. I started in Leicester Square. My phone's map and thought it knew a pretty good way of getting there in 20 minutes walk. But, I, but it wanted me to walk on all the main roads where the passing cars and the rainy tarmac made so much noise I couldn't even hear myself think. So I took myself on my own route, on the cobbledy wobbledy side streets and alleys that looked like they had in the time of King Edward and Queen Victoria, save for the strange growths of satellite dishes rudely bolted to their sides, all facing the same direction, like a crowd of round idiot faces all baffled by some distant phenomenon in the night sky. Just then, in the narrow wet streets with my springy soled boots bounding me down the pavement, the London beating shushing through my nearby through the nearby main roads, everything I owned on my back, it felt like the opening credits of a movie. The movie of Trent McCauley's life, starring Trent McCauley as Trent McCauley, with special guest stars Trent McCauley and Trent McCauley, and maybe a surprise cameo from Scott Colford as the worshipful sidekick. And then the big opening shot, wandering up, wading, wending my way up a dingy road between Trafalgar Square and into Leicester Square in full tilt. Every light was lit, every square meter of the ground held at least four people occupying it, and nearly everyone was either laughing, smoking a gigantic spliff, shouting drunkenly, or holding a signboard advertising something dubious, cheap, and urgent. Some of them were doing all of these things. The men were dressed like gangsters out of a film. The women looked like softcore porn stars or runway models with lots of wet fabric clinging to curves that would have put Mona Lisa to shame. I stood on the edge of it for a moment like a swimmer about to jump into a pool, and then I jumped. I just pushed my way in, bouncing back and forth like a rubber ball in a room that was all corners and trampolines. Someone handed me a spliff, an older guy with eyes like a baboon's arse, horny fingernails yellow and thick, and I sucked up a double lung full of fragrant skunk, the crackle of the paper somehow loud over the sound of a million conversations and raindrops. The end was soggy with the slobber of any number of strangers, and I passed it on to a pair of girls in glittering pink bowler hats and angel wings, sporting huge hen knight badges to one side of their deep cleavage. One kissed me on the cheek, drunken fumes and a bit of tongue, and I reeled away, drunk on glorious London. A movie let out and spilled 800 more people into the night, holding huge cups of fizzy drink, wafting the smells of cologne and perfume into the evening. The beggars descended on them like flies, and they scattered coins like royalty before peasants. They were all talking movies, movies, movies. The Marquis said that he'd been to see that time we all got stupid and how much fun it was, wasn't it? The latest and most extreme example of the ridiculous trend to extra long movie titles. I'd heard good things about it, downloaded the first 20 minutes after it played the festival circuit last year, and would have given anything to fall in alongside those chattering people and join the chatter. But it was a wet night, and they were hurrying for the road, hurrying to get in cabs and get out of the wet, and the next show let in, and soon the square was nearly empty. Just beggars, coppers, men with sideboards, signboards, and me. The opening credits had run. The first big scene had concluded. The camera was zooming in on our hero, and he was about to do something heroic and decisive, something that would take him on his first step to destiny. Only I had no bloody clue what that step might be. 
I didn't sleep at all that night. I made my way to Soho, where the clubs were still heaving and disgorging happy people, and I hung about on their periphery until 3 a.m. I ducked into a, full, a few all-night cafes to use the toilet and get warm, pretending to be part of larger groups so that no one asked me to buy anything. Then the Soho crowds fell away. I knew that somewhat, somewhere in London there were all-night parties going on, but I had no idea where to find them. Without the crowds for camouflage, I felt like I was wearing a neon sign that read, I am new in town, underage, carrying cash, physically defenseless and easily tricked. Please take advantage of me. As I walked the streets, faces leered out of the dark at me, hissing offers of drugs or sex or just hissing, come here, come here, see what I've got. I didn't want to see what they had. To be absolutely honest, I wanted my mummy. Finally, the sun rose, and morning joggers and dog walkers began to appear on the pavements. Bleary-eyed dad, dads pushed past me with prams that emitted the cries of sleepless babes. I had a legless, drunken feeling as I walked down Oxford Street, heading west with the sun rising behind me and my shadow stretching before me as long as a pipe cleaner man. I found myself in Hyde Park at the Marble Arch end, and now there were more joggers and cyclists and little kids kicking around a football wearing jerseys and shorts and puffing out clouds of condensation in the frigid morning. I sat down on the sidelines in the damp grass next to the little group of wary parents and watched the ball roll from kid to kid, listened to the happy sounds of physical exertion and play. The sun got higher and warmed my face, and I made a pillow out of my jacket and my pack and leaned back and let my eyes close and the warmth dry out the long night. My mind was whirling a thousand miles per hour, trying to figure out where I'd go and what I'd do now that I'd come to the big city. But sleep wouldn't be put off by panic, and my tired, tired body insisted on rest, and before I knew it, I'd gone to sleep. It was a wonderful, sweet-scented sleep, punctuated with the sounds of happy people passing by and playing, dogs barking and chasing balls, kids frolicking in the grass, buses and taxis belching in the distance. And when I woke, I just lay there, basking in the wonder and beauty of it all. I was in London, I was young, I was no longer a danger to my family, I was on the adventure of my life, it was all going to be all right. And that's when I noticed that someone had stolen my backpack out from under my head while I slept, taking my laptop, my spare clothes, my toothbrush, everything. And that's the prologue. Thank you. So we have time for questions. Is that right, Sandra?